Hey guys, Steve from Vosprung Suspension here. Welcome to the Tuesday Tune. This week I'm going to talk about something quite abstract to a lot of people. Uh, a little bit about why suspension forks are the way they are. So what I'm going to show you, first of all, is two different forks. This one here is a Fox 36. This is a uh, Pink Bike's current fork of the year. And this one here is a Fox 34. What these are both examples of is a telescopic fork. So for those who aren't aware, a telescopic fork just means any fork where the thing telescopes inside itself. So it literally, you know, this part here slides inside there. The alternatives to these are basically linkage forks. Every now and then someone will reinvent the wheel or the fork uh, in the form of another type of linkage fork. Most of the variants that are put out there, you know, time and time again, are new takes on existing concepts. For example, right now there is the Motion France carbon linkage fork getting around, which looks pretty interesting. Anyway, why have these become the industry standard and not linkage forks or some other alternative? When we look at telescopic fork, one of the most, well, least obvious, I suppose, things once you're used to looking at it, uh, but one of the most important things about it, structurally, is that it gives you a very direct connection of your frame, where the head tube goes over the steerer there, to your wheel. So the axle and the frame are connected in a straight line. So given that this wheel has to move in that direction, uh, it's doing it in basically the most efficient way possible, structurally, because this is connected from there to there in you know, the shortest possible distance, which is obviously a straight line. This makes them uh, fairly light as well. Typically, you're not wasting space and zigzagging back and forth with a more complex structure. This also means that they all have the same axle path. Now, axle path is not something that we ever talk about with uh, mountain bike forks. It's often talked about in the context of the linkage of the rear end of the bike uh, because there are variations of high pivots, low pivots. However, we take it for granted with the front end of the bike because we all know that this has a linear axle path, you know, the front wheel moves in a straight line and that that is just what it is on every bike. So we never discuss it. The only thing that really affects that is the head angle. As a result, they all have the same trail characteristics uh, with a given offset, that is. Uh, so the offset being the horizontal offset of the axle from the crown there. So it's a bit hard to see because it's too close to the camera here. But basically the axle is offset for a certain distance uh, if you're not sure what trail is, I suggest you Google it. Probably come up with trail forks first, but if you search uh, motorcycle fork trail, that will come up with some good explanations of what it is, why it's important. Suffice to say, I'm not going to go into that, but it is very important for handling and steering of a motorbike or a mountain bike. And so when we have something that has, when we have a range of products, I should say, like a range of suspension forks that all have the same axle path, they all have the same trail characteristics for a given offset, uh, and most of the mountain bike forks on the market have actually kind of agreed on one of a couple of different uh, offsets according to wheel size. This is important because it means that you can change one fork for another, uh, and if the axle the crown and the offset are the same, it will actually handle the same on the bike. The fork may not perform the same in terms of bump absorption or anything like that, but the bike will have the same steering characteristics. This is a very important point that is often overlooked uh, by linkage fork proponents. The consistent handling between forks and basically the modular nature of this means that you can unplug this from your bike and just unbolt it, slide it out, slide a new fork in and be good to go. There's no messing around, there's no, oh this changed the wheelbase of my bike, this changed the, uh, you know, the trail characteristics as the fork compresses. You don't have to relearn how to ride the bike. They also have a one-to-one -one motion ratio between uh, the spring and the damper and the front axle. This makes it relatively easy for development to be consistent uh, for these aspects of the fork, so the spring and the damper, because every company knows that they are developing around the same requirements. So if you're designing a shock for a rear end of a bike or for any other linkage where the motion ratio isn't one-to-one, -one, so that is the damper and the spring are not compressing as far as the wheel is moving, then you need to take that into account each time. This is also, if you notice, very well packaged. It's very integrated. So we have the structure, the stanchions, the, uh, the lowers, the crown, and we have a spring system in this leg here and a damp system in this leg here. It's all very well integrated. You know, the damper has to slide, obviously, it's a telescoping device itself. So there's the spring, and they fit really nice and neatly inside the stanchions. Linkage forks don't offer that. 
Telescopic forks have also been refined for over 100 years. Now, they've been around since at least 1908, to my knowledge, uh, on motorbikes. That means that they have a lot of R&D time and money invested in them. So when we get to stuff today that is like relatively high tech, you know, we have seal, uh, like sliding seals that are the best I've ever been. They're still garbage, but they're the best I've ever been. They're now at a, you know, a usable point in terms of being low friction and whatnot. We have these, you know, fancy stanchion coatings, Kashima coat on this one, to reduce friction uh, and a whole bunch of other things, you know, Teflon coated bushings, super tight tolerances, all these things that have been developed over a very long period of time that have actually made the telescopic fork viable. They've basically made it succeed in spite of itself. So the drawbacks of the telescopic fork. Now the main one that linkage fork proponents like to push is brake dive. And this is very true. So you have a fork on an angle like that, bike is moving forward that way, braking force is acting that way, it is a portion of that braking force is acting parallel to the fork and trying to compress it. You also have, because the rider's mass is above the, uh, where the wheels are, you also have that forward weight shift that loads up the front wheel. So you have a combination of the tractive force at the front wheel directly pushing the fork and compressing it, and the rider's weight shifting forward, or the, the weight load shifting forward, I should say, uh, that compresses the suspension. And that's why brake dive is very real concern with telescopic forks. That introduces uh, another variable that we have to compensate for, either with spring rate or damping rate, that if it wasn't there, we could much more easily optimize those factors. So proponents of linkage forks are very keen to point that out. And that is a legitimate concern. As I said before, some of the other disadvantages are sliding seals are shit. They are the best I've ever been. They are still garbage compared to uh, anything that doesn't slide. So what I mean by that, any debris that gets in there is a problem. Any damage to this stanchion is a problem. Uh, you have something that's sliding back and forth and therefore very hard to lubricate compared to anything that rotates. So if we can get rid of sliding seals, that makes life a lot easier. Sliding surfaces also suck. Uh, if they are sliding linearly like that rather than uh, in a rotary manner. Under brakes, telescopic forks are also prone to bending. You have the weight of uh, the rider and frame being transmitted through uh, the steer tube up here, braking force pushing that way on the axle, and it's basically bending the whole thing back like that. That means that we are binding up on the bushings, uh, and that creates friction within the bushings, creates misalignment. The seals means that we need to have more squeeze of the seals and blah, blah, blah. All this creates more friction, inhibits bump absorption. Telescopic forks also require extremely tight tolerances in order to work. Having the right tolerance between your stanchion and your bushings in the lowers so that everything slides properly uh, is critical. And obviously the seal and the stanchion. And then the damper shaft and the damper bushing and the damper piston and the damper cartridge and the air spring shaft and the air spring seal head and the air spring piston and the inside of the stanchion or whatever it's sliding on. There's a lot of these things that you have to get right in order for it to have acceptably low friction. So what are the potential advantages of linkage forks? Well, obviously we can control brake dive. We all know that. You have the ability to have much more uh, mechanical advantage over the sliding components. So the damper that you still have to assemble somewhere in that whole structure because you can essentially have a higher motion ratio, a higher leverage ratio. And that basically means that uh, if you have more leverage over the damper, in order to push it, you can push past the seal friction more easily. Because it's not on a structural component, you can make the seals tighter, lower friction, and last longer. Everything wins in that regard. There's no binding or friction issues because they typically use bearings, unless they're dumb enough to use bushings, in which case you still have the same sort of issues. So, if we get to the disadvantages of linkage forks, packaging is really difficult. So we need to have uh, multiple swinging arms of some description, multiple uh, links. They need somewhere to swing, they need to not hit the frame, they need to be able to turn, it all needs to be connected to the steering axis somehow. There's a million and one ways that this has been done in the past. Some of them have worked better than others. If you look up the Valentino Rebi fork on uh, Roger DeCosta's Honda, Honda, Suzuki, Honda, from the 1980s, uh, that was a great example of a very successful linkage fork, but it was super heavy, and at the time, it was super expensive to produce. It just got canned, they went back to telescopics. Wait is more difficult with linkage forks because they're not as well structurally integrated. You don't have your spring and 
uh, damper housed inside the stanchion. You know, you're not using the stanchion tube as your spring tube or your damper tube. And the fact that you know you don't have as direct a path from your uh, your steer tube, uh, sorry, your head tube to your axle, they tend to be heavier. The the biggest issue though with linkage forks is that you now have a lot more variables to get right. You have to balance axle path. You have to have a leverage ratio that works well. You have to have a spring and a damper system that both work well. You have to catch up hundreds of years of R&D that's gone into uh, telescopic forks and somehow match that performance with uh, a lot more variables and a lot more things to get wrong. You know, there's more things to get right, but there's more things to get wrong. As a result, getting it right so far in a commercial sense hasn't really happened. And the reason that I'm actually doing this video is because I saw this Motion France fork a while ago. And I was like, wow, that actually looks really cool. Um, that has a lot of potential if they get it right. But you only need one thing to go wrong to sink it. If you have something that is too heavy, won't sell. Have something that is too flexible, won't sell. Bad spring design, won't sell. Bad damper design, won't sell. Weird axle path that makes the bike handle funny, won't sell. Costs too much, won't sell. And this is probably the biggest issue with the Motion France fork. It's like 25 or 2400 euros, I think. It's an expensive fork. So if you're going to have an axle path that is very close to linear, like a telescopic fork and parallel to the steering axis, then you can eliminate some of the handling issues. But then you need to make sure that your motion ratio uh, for the spring and damp are good, that your spring and damping rates are good, unless you're going to have a shock that you can swap out. Like if you used an off the shelf shock, then you could potentially make that happen. And the biggest problem that they really have is that in the mountain bike world especially, no one really takes them seriously. It's like, yeah, okay, it might work better, but this has been tried a thousand times in the past. Obviously the devil, the devil's in the details. The details always determine how well something works in the real world. Uh, but you have a huge number of commercial failures in the past in the mountain bike industry and to a less degree, possibly a greater degree actually, in the motorcycle industry where people have produced linkage forks and said, this is better than telescopics. It doesn't have brake dive, it doesn't have brake bind, uh, it doesn't do this, that, and the other. But then they neglected the fact that it makes the bike handle terribly, or it weighs twice as much, or it costs four times as much, or whatever it may be. Anyway, that's been uh, my ramble on telescopic forks, why they are the way they are, uh, how they've become the dominant force in the mountain bike industry, and why I think they are a really great example of why simplification, uh, even in something, even with something that is in theory actually a worse design, worse design, uh, because it doesn't control the brake dive well. You know, it does create compromises there. Because it's simpler, we don't have to worry about axle path or handling or anything like that when you change them over. Because of that, and the greatly reduced number of variables no motion ratio to worry about, no axle path, no variation of trail, uh, no packaging issues that are going to collide with certain frames. Because of that, they can focus on getting the spring rates and the damping rates as dialed as they can. And now, these things are not without substantial room for improvement. There's a long way to go with those, in my opinion. But what this really highlights is how hard it is to get things right when you have too many variables. And I think that is something that we can all learn from in terms of setting up your suspension. If you confuse yourself with having too many variables, and that might mean too many adjustments, or you know, you go and ride a different trail from the last time you made an adjustment, or you do it in different conditions, or whatever it may be. Every time you introduce a new variable, you make it exponentially more difficult to get right. Anyway, any questions, feedback, comments, we'd love to hear them, um, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks.